I just would love to say how happy I am to be here. And uh, I've, I've had a very interesting day meeting with students, uh, meeting with colleagues. Uh, it's really been great. You've got a, a wonderful place here. And uh, you're very lucky to be here. Uh, I'd like to thank John Downing very much for the, his support and me being here and Gary Kolb as well. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to take you on a little journey. <clears throat> Let's see how this looks. Okay. <laughs> yeah, the, we did have to go to the local historical museum to find this projector, but, uh, uh, but I still love slides. Can't help it live with a little bit of dust, it's okay. Um, so the, I went to, uh, to China in 1996, and I was lecturing at the People's University of China School for Journalism. And I also did a lecture for the Chinese Photographers Association in Beijing. Um, and the Chinese photographers were talking about the Three Gorges Dam at that time, and I, that was the first time I'd ever heard of it. I found it fascinating uh, because it, part of my, my own interests in, in thinking about culture uh, it has to do with the kinds of decisions that we make. And in this particular instance, <clears throat> I happened to be working on, on this particular body of work in 1996. Uh, they're they're eight-foot hand-colored photographs. So in a certain sense, scale was already kind of an interest of mine. Uh, these images are, are three separate four by five uh, photographs that are all printed on the same sheet of mural paper. Uh, it was very important uh, from my perspective that these images were actually physically connected on the same sheet of paper as opposed to uh, different prints uh, just mounted together. You know, what these things are about for me uh, is taking a look at, at how we perceive time and space. And from my perspective, I think that there's some flaws involved in, in how we perceive time and space. Um, for example, if, uh, if someone said they were going to bury toxic waste in your backyard, it's going to bother you a lot more than if they say they're going to bury it somewhere else on the planet. That's space. If they said the toxic waste in your backyard is not going to hurt you for a thousand years or anyone else, it's going to bother you a lot less than if they said you're going to start having symptoms tomorrow. That's time. The point being that the people who voted uh, to build the dam uh, in 1992, and I might add that the National People's Congress, when they did vote for it, one-third of that group either abstained or voted against it. And if any of you are familiar with the National People's Congress, it basically is a rubber stamp for whatever the government wants. So this is an ev some evidence of how controversial it was. Oops, what happened there? Okay. <clears throat> Let's try turning off the autofocus. Okay. So the, the point being that if the people in the National People's Congress who voted for the construction of the dam had to live near it, I don't think they would have voted for it. If they believed for a moment that something horrible would happen and something would go wrong and perhaps millions of lives lost, uh, during their lifetime, they wouldn't have voted for it. So that's, that's time and space. So the journey begins in Chongqing, which is uh, 400 miles upstream from the construction site of the dam. 
and we're, we're going to travel from what is the, the furthest most point uh, from the dam, uh, at the terminus of what's now the reservoir, traveling downstream uh, to the construction site. Now keep in mind, most of what we're going to be looking at is underwater now, because in 2003, um, the, the reservoir filled to uh, uh, 475 meters. Let's try the autofocus again. I was curious if it was just doing that when I walked away and turned my back. Um, this is the new harbor in Chongqing. Uh, Chongqing for 4,000 years is, has been a, a center of commerce in China. One of the reasons that the government wanted to build this dam was, in fact, to allow 10,000 ton cargo, ocean going cargo ships, to come up the river into the heart of China through an area that's, that's one of the most impoverished areas in the country. So that there was an interest in trying to improve the economy. So we're standing right now in the, the bottom of the reservoir. Now the, the idea to construct this dam is something that's been going on uh, since 1918 when Dr. Sun Yat-sen uh, first proposed it as part of his plan for national reconstruction. But over the years, it, it really hadn't uh, been able to move forward, technical reasons, political reasons, financial reasons, until in 1992, Li Pang was able to push it through. Now, I had a friend that helped me with this Chinese person. Uh, I flew in from another part of China. And we had quite a long discussion about this process of, of making these photographs. Uh, because the Chinese photographers had told me they would have a lot of difficulty trying to do what I was planning to do. They said, quote unquote, they might have big problems. Uh, so I, had, I talked with my friend about the situation. And my friend said, you know, uh, it's possible that the government actually, the highest levels of government, don't really know exactly what's going on here because people are trying to protect themselves and not necessarily tell their superiors that things aren't going so well. Um, so my friend said, you know, I, I had said that, uh, you know, you'd be taking a, a bigger risk than I uh, in making this trip. And my friend said that it's important that it's a reality story, my friend said. Uh, Chongqing is also considered one of China's most polluted cities. It's said that uh, just living in Chongqing is like smoking a pack of cigarettes a day. And pollution is all, also a, a huge uh, problem all over the world. Uh, but the kind of growth that's been taking place in China, they're really in a very dangerous situation right now. Uh, there was a, a scientist that just about a year ago, uh, this month, uh, who was involved in the original feasibility studies for the dam in the mid-80s, had said in the newspaper that if something isn't done within the next five years, seriously done, uh, to correct the pollution issues that are taking place in the Yangtze River, that in five years, he described it as being a cancerous river, not even suitable for agriculture, let alone drinking. Uh, I thought this was interesting because uh, before I actually found out that he's fishing, uh, I saw it as a kind of symbolic personal dam that he was constructing for himself, you know, 400 miles upstream from the big one. But apparently there's a, a species of fish that looks for depressions in the sand. And when the, the water rises as a result of a, a boat passing and then recedes, he finds fish. Uh, the, there's a couple of little sequences like this one. It's the same fellow carrying the, the palm trees.
You know, the Yangtze River is 3,926 miles long. It's the third longest river in the world. It also carries a tremendous amount of sediment. And this is a huge problem for a, a, a dam that's uh, essentially a gravity dam. Um, and because of deforestation being another huge problem, uh, in the studies that were done in the 80s, hardly anything at all was said about the effect of deforestation on sedimentation rates and so on. So now we're hearing stories uh, about boats being stranded downstream um, from the construction, uh, from the dam itself. This is the, uh, the guardian of the boxes. I purposely went to, to do this project at the beginning of the flooding season, because flooding was the second of the three we, three primary reasons that the government said we, need, we should build this dam. Um, and the year before this, this was in 1999 when I did the photographs, and 1998 was the worst flooding in 44 years. And some 3,000 people were believed to have been killed and untold amounts of, of money uh, to replace the loss of crops and, and damage to homes and other buildings. But after leaving here, approximately three days later, there was something in the newspaper about how the water had suddenly risen and 12,000 soldiers were, were called out to uh, help people that were caught off guard and to help with sandbags. And it really does rise and fall incredibly quickly. Overnight, five feet up. Next day, five feet down. So a little advertisement that I shot for future cola. You can see in the background there are some markings about the future water levels. But I thought it was just kind of odd, because I was there really kind of thinking about the future. And here's a, you know, a cola product. Um, whose title is Future Cola, but written in English. <clears throat> so see those, those level markings in the background? Is that that whole area is underwater now? Is that correct? Or? Um, in 2009, that area will be. Because if, if I'm reading it correctly, it's saying 180 meters. Okay. Uh, it's going up to 175 meters. But that's at the construction site. And if it actually goes to 175 meters at the construction site. There is a slope to this reservoir. In over 400 miles, it's something like uh, 90 feet. So if it actually goes that high at the dam, this is certainly going to be underwater. And there's all kinds of problems associated with that. Uh, that's very serious. We're underneath some new highways. It's part of the infrastructure for the reservoir before it rises. This is some indication. You can see the numbers on the side of the cliff of really what this water level can do during a flooding season or a heavy rain. The numbers are essentially there for boat captains so that they have a good sense of where they need to go or shouldn't go. Now, this place is gone. There were 13 cities, 140 towns, 1,352 villages disappeared. It's a bamboo factory in a city called Changso. <clears throat> I was accused of being a spy when I was here. Uh, and my friend is, is very smart, very funny. Uh, said to the, the fellow that was accusing us of being spies, well, we must be really terrible spies, because here we are in the middle of the day where everyone could see us. We're not trying to hide. So he finally agreed, well, you know, maybe we're not spies. <clears throat> There's a couple of aesthetic strategies at work here. And one of them is that we know that there's 30 million people that live in the, in the reservoir region. 
there's very few photographs that, that I've made that have huge crowds of people in them. Because my interest really was because of the two million people that are being forced to relocate their lives to bring it back down to human scale. So most of the photographs that, that you'll be seeing are really of one or a few other individuals doing what they normally do on a daily basis. That's the uh, Yangtze River from Fulin. You can see all the, the factories along it. Uh, this woman was told that uh, she and her husband needed to move to Tibet. And she refused to go and found some friends to help her build a new house higher up on the mountainside from her old family home. It's one of the things that the Chinese government's been using in, in conjunction with the relocation of its population, uh, in fact, to populate places like Tibet with Chinese nationals. Some 40,000 crips are gone. Um, particularly difficult for the older citizens of, of China who live in this area that were hoping to be buried with their, their ancestors. as friends at a, a new housing construction site. Um, something that's kind of interesting in doing documentary work uh, is that as a photographer, I mean, I do want to make interesting photographs. But at the same time, I don't want to make the photographs be completely about how skillfully perhaps I filled the frame. I still want it to be about the subject at hand. And there's something that's, that's reminiscent of those ideas in this photograph, uh, where I remember looking through the, the, the viewfinder and, and thinking, you know, I really like what's going on here. But still, at the same time, it says something about the closeness of the people and the friendship between them. I just like the idea that someone's carrying a door through a doorway. Um, the symbol above the door indicates that it's a, a government building of some sort. And if, if a policeman saw me do this, I probably would have gotten in trouble. It's another example of that kind of photograph that, that's sort of weaving together kind of aesthetic concerns and, uh, and content concerns. Um, my friend told me that I could recognize uh, the secret police because they wear black pants, a white shirt, stand on the street corner, look like they just got a new haircut, and chain smoke. <clears throat> so there's 1,600 factories and manufacturing facilities along this 400 mile stretch of the river. A big concern of, of scientists, environmentalists, and so on, was that a lot of these facilities, like in our country and other countries around the world, have been burying toxic waste in the ground. In this particular instance, um, lead, mercury, cyanide, um, even radioactive waste. And what's happened is now that the, the ground is saturated, uh, these, these poisons are, are finding their way into the reservoir. And for a long time, uh, thousands of years, millions of years, that, that river's current was incredibly powerful. I mean, I'll never forget seeing that myself. Uh, but once the, the dam uh, was finished to a point where they could fill the reservoir, there's almost no current at all. So you have all these chemicals and things that are just really kind of collecting in it. And even to this day, uh, only 20% of all of the residential waste, 30 million people, and industrial waste uh, is being treated. The rest of it's going into the reservoir. The city of Fengdu really a kind of a remarkable place and, and oh here we go again 
in Chinese uh, folklore. Maybe I have to stand here and see what happens. Um, Feng Du is, is considered a magical, is it moving? <laughs> It's only certain photographs. We should take notes of which ones this is because there might be something going on. Um, um, in Chinese legend, it's, it's considered a magical city. It's where our souls go to be judged when we die. This city was dynamited a year ahead of schedule totally flattened. And there were two reasons. One was there was concern when the reservoir fills that some of these giant ships, the 10,000 ton ocean going freighters, might hit the tops of the buildings if they weren't knocked down first. Um, the other reason was a lot of the people that were being moved away from their homes were, being, uh, were farmers and were being sent to areas where the ground, the soil, just isn't suitable for them to survive. And they actually were moving back. So the government wanted to stop that. And that's why this city was dynamited a year early. The other thing that I don't want to forget to mention about the 10,000 ton ships is that in reality, they can't go up the river. They're not going to make it to Chongqing. Because it turns out there were several bridges spanning the Yangtze River, which were not built high enough to allow them to pass under. So the government's talking now about, well, they're really saying that it's going to be several barges that are put together, and it's going to equal the capacity of a, one of the ocean-going vessels. What was interesting about this particular place, souls go there to be judged. The fellow that was in charge of uh, moving the population of this city to other areas was found to have embezzled $1.4 million dollars. He's not the only one. There are plenty of others. But uh, he was sentenced to death. His soul was judged there. And uh, I think September 18th, uh, 2003, uh, he was put to death by lethal injection. Funeral banners in the background and uh, a sulfur-based fertilizer that's being moved in those bags. Uh, because of the need for food in China, population, and the scarcity of, of good quality land, uh, the land is really being overworked and it's causing more and more fertilizer to become part of the process of farming. That too finds its way into the water system. There was something about feeling like I was in a Rus Russian existential novel in a way because I knew that these people's lives were about to be turned upside down. They knew their lives were about to be turned upside down. But still, everybody was really trying to go about their business and making the things that they make, a chair maker. Um, but still, you have to think when they're falling asleep at night or in a quiet moment, they're thinking about, where am I going to be in three years? It was, it was very strange. This is a sign talking about, don't steal the wire. And in the background is the uh, bridge to heaven. You can picture this guy in Vegas in a couple of years. <clears throat> a lot of gambling going on. Chinese love to gamble. And, uh, and I think the Three Gorges Dam is one of the biggest gambles. One of the things that really struck me when I'd heard about it, and I'd mentioned it when I was opening the, the presentation, was you know, thinking about the kinds of decisions that we make as individuals and as societies. And what struck me was when I'd heard that experts within and without and outside of China had advised the government 
that everything you say you want this gigantic dam to do can be done by four smaller dams built on the tributaries. Everything they said, it can be done that way. And if it was four smaller dams, uh, the electricity would be less expensive to produce. Uh, two million people would not have to relocate. You wouldn't have the pollution issues that are taking place today. But at the same time, uh, Lee Pong and his friends uh, couldn't say they have built the big, biggest dam in the world. So we're sort of in that uh, the kind of, I guess, the pyramid syndrome, you know, where leaders want to build these monuments in honor of themselves, regardless of the cost uh, to the common person. I mentioned how the rarity of, of good farmland and where we're standing now is gone. Uh, 250,000 acres of China's most fertile farmland disappeared. Chinese military is concerned. They're concerned that the country is becoming too dependent on food from outside its own borders. That's Wanshen. The ancient village below and in the new city above. This is probably uh, the one photograph that actually has a larger group of people. And if I was to spin the camera around, you would see thousands of people in this square just kind of hanging out and visiting and buying things, trading things. Um, but while I was doing this, one thing I didn't realize, uh, this is after the sun had gone down and I was working on a tripod and I had quarter second, half second exposures. Well, there were about 100 of these 2,000 people were standing right behind me watching what I was doing. And it really surprised me when I turned around and all of a sudden there was this crowd watching. Um, so I, I asked the fellow next to me if he, I pointed it to my eye and at the camera, and I just said, chin, invite. Um, he looked through and he said um, to the person behind him, Pioliang, uh, beautiful. And I heard that kind of go back through this group, Pioliang. And I said to a woman standing on the other side of me, Johar, uh, child or children, because I thought this is really kind of fun. And the same thing happened going back through this crowd. You know, It was pretty amazing. Um, also something that occurred to me while I was making these photographs in, in terms of the history of photography, when you, I think about... Uh, photographers like William Henry Jackson and Timothy O'Sullivan and others, uh, is that tendency, and even Bierstadt, Albert Bierstadt, painter, for example, uh, would include a small figure or small animal uh, somewhere in this, in this landscape. And I was responding to this landscape I was aware of in much the same way uh, that those individuals were responding to the Western landscape in the United States. Uh, water pipes for new construction. Very interested in how photographs work on multiple levels simultaneously. The reality story about this is that uh, it's the boat captain's son, and I would rent boats when I could and, and just kind of go up and down the river in different areas. Uh, it was extremely hot. And he was protecting his head from the sun with his black shirt. But the response that I had to seeing this, just this gesture, uh, and I'm sure you feel it too, is quite different than just protecting his head from the sun. Uh, Chutan Gorge, first of the three gorges. I just loved the atmospheric perspective that I, I, I noticed in this particular landscape is that for a moment I was connected to the, the painters for hundreds and hundreds of years in China who were incorporating atmospheric perspective in the way that they painted. And I could see exactly what they saw and why they painted the way that they did. Uh, this is in Wusan. You get a sense of, of how quickly the water rises and falls because all of these communities along the river have these enormous 
staircases to allow access and, and to try to avoid as much flooding as possible. I thought the calligraphy was fascinating. You know, it, it really is designed to, to imitate the, the knives that they make. <coughs> Thousands of garbage dumps along the river. The government thought that they might try to sort through all of these and, and decide which would be safe to incinerate, what can be buried, etc. Um, it was really too much to, to try and do. So once the reservoir filled June 10th, 2003, there was one small area that I was reading about uh, where every single day 30,000 tons of garbage was being removed from the surface of the water. <clears throat> and this is hospital waste and a lot, of, a lot of nasty stuff. The other thing that was going on, um, which you wouldn't get from the photographs, is that I was being followed all the time. Uh, this fellow was following me, um, about a 20 millimeter lens on the camera, so he didn't know that he was actually in the shot. And apparently I was followed a lot uh, and didn't know about it. Uh, don't know if it's a, an entrepreneurial spirit that he just decides himself, I'm going to follow this foreigner and see if I can catch him doing something that the police would want to know about and then I can collect part of the $500 fine that they would tell him, uh, tell me I would need to pay uh, so that I don't have to go to prison. Uh, the other option is that, in fact, the police actually told him and others, uh, if you see foreigners, uh, see what they're up to. There's a lot of paranoia, primarily because of all the corruption. I mean, the government officials really want to protect their own rear ends. This is going to be the water level in 2009. It's coming fairly soon. I'd love to be able to go back and make the same trip and see how this part of the planet's been transformed by the, the reservoir. It's 50 miles longer than Lake Michigan, by the way. That's the same sign above the children's heads. So where we're standing is underwater now. Now, this is in Dragon Gate Village. Uh, I remember when I was looking through the viewfinder, uh, my friend was involved in an argument with some of the people in the village about um, what's going on. But I remember when I was looking through the viewfinder thinking immediately uh, that for me this kind of represented the, the hold that the government has over the people of China. It happens to also be an Asian longhorn beetle, which is the beetle that's eating a lot of the trees around here. So the, one of the village elders, uh, the fellow uh, all the way on your right, <clears throat> came up to my friend and myself in the middle of the day when we were just walking around photographing in the village, and he was really angry. He said, what is this foreigner doing in our village making pictures? And when he understood through my friend that I was there to make a document of his beautiful valley, he saw the expression on his face change, and he invited us to his home for dinner. And that was quite a shift. Um, and it also was, for me, one of the most memorable experiences of this journey. We were getting ready to leave, and the, the village elder said, would you make a photograph of us before you go? He, he wanted to be part of the record of this place, and it was really a very emotional moment for me. Uh, the other thing that's kind of uh, on more of an aesthetic note is that the exposures were three seconds long, and sometimes I would say, E.R. San, you know, one, two, three. And sometimes I wouldn't. I would just start an exposure and let it go. And this was one of those occasions where I just made an exposure and stopped the exposure. People that were holding still are sharp. The people that were moving are soft. But what it was for me was I knew and they knew that very shortly they're leaving. 
And for me, on a symbolic level, the blurred people were those that internally are already partially gone. They've already partially left. Uh, Dragon Gate Gorge. Uh, it's a, a home of an ancient culture known as the Ba. And one of the best sites for this culture is in this valley, further upstream, Danning River. Um, and that site's gone now. This is uh, the Danning River, one of the tributaries to the Yangtze. All right, we're getting closer to the dam. You know, this is Badong. You can see some of the new city uh, being built across the way. Engineers also warned the, some of the government officials to not build these buildings in some of the areas that they were uh, proceeding with construction because the ground, they said, was not stable enough to support them. So in a number of the cities, some that we've already looked at, the new buildings, some of them started to slide down the side of the, uh, the riverbank towards the water and had to be torn down and rebuilt somewhere else. It's kind of a, a Chinese painting influenced image to me. But then also on a symbolic level, uh, the broken branch, no leaves, bird, um, kind of a dream of freedom in a way. You can't tell, but it's, a, it's actually a, a, a stream, and the stream is filled with garbage. These fellows, I asked one of them what they were doing, and I couldn't understand the answer, so my friend went over. And when my friend came back with this like kind of crazy smile, and I said, what's the deal? And, uh, and then I was told that they are hunting for cobras, and I did not know we were walking where there are cobras. I did not know that there are also alligators, and I didn't know that there were tigers. And, uh, but that's why he's got two hats. So if he actually does find a, a cobra, and, and they're highly sought after in, uh, in China for food, uh, very special food, um, they actually make quite a bit of money. But the second hat is to help protect himself, like a shield. 2,000-year-old city of Zigui. It's gone now. It was a home to a very famous poet patriot in China by the name of Chu Yuan. You might know him as a result of, of dragon boat races. And the dragon boat race is a, a symbolic rescue of Chu Yuan. He once wrote, for what my heart is in love with, I would die nine times without a regret, a frown, or a sigh. And he did tie a rock to himself and throw, him, throw, throw himself into the river and, and drowned. But I was really curious, why nine times? And I happened to meet somebody from Chengdu, the capital of Sichuan, at an SPE conference, Society of Photographic Education, and we were talking about that. He said, do you know who Chu Yuan is? Oh, yes, of course, sir. In this poem that he wrote, why the number nine? And she said, in China, if you say you would do something nine times, that means there's no limit to what you would do. I thought, that's incredible. And then I started thinking about the number nine. I did the photographs in 1999. I was 45 when I made the photographs, nine the first time they were exhibited, there were 81 photographs equal nine. Um, Cats have nine lives. Stitch in, in time saves nine. There's a rock in, in Great Britain that has a hole in it, and you're supposed to path through, pass through it naked nine times. So, I mean, I don't think I'm really superstitious. I think maybe I'm just stitious. Um, but I do set my alarm at 7.02 if I have to get up at 7. I was told that this new bridge above uh, had collapsed not long after this photograph was made. It turns out that the newspaper article also said 
that 27 bridges had collapsed. And I asked my friend, were there torrential rains and mudslides and, you know, things like that? And my friend said, no, they fall down by themselves. And the reason is that there's so much corruption and bribes that have to be paid in order for this individual to build this particular uh, bridge, he had to pay somebody a lot of money. So they cut back on the quality of the cement, concrete, steel, construction, etc. After that, uh, 20 bridges were inspected and 17 of them were found to have problems. Some of them had to be dynamited and others um, were repaired. And people had lost their lives as a result of these issues. Uh, the worst one, uh, curiously, the, the name of the, the beautiful name of this bridge is the Rainbow Bridge. And it collapsed, uh, and 40 people died, 23 military that were doing exercises on it, and, uh, and the rest were civilian. The fellow who was involved in that uh, project was also sentenced to death. Stabilizing the, the shoreline is very important. Uh, there's a lot of concern about collapse of, of the shoreline and parts of mountains falling into the river and creating tidal waves, tsunamis. 8,000 known archaeological sites are gone. Uh, this is one of them. There's a, a fellow, he was, I don't know if he still is anymore, uh, Yu Wei Chao was the director of the National History Museum in China. And at the time that I was there in 1999 to do these photographs, uh, he had said that the government's only put aside $2.3 million to rescue all of the ancient places. Uh, and at the time, uh, Yu Wei Chao, uh, said they actually needed about $225 million to even do a little. And this was actually the, the second time he battled the government over these kinds of issues. Uh, the first time um, was during the Cultural Revolution and the Red Guard, you know, running through the, the cities and, and destroying temples and things like that. Well, Yue Chao got in their way and tried to, to save some of these places, and they, um, they cut his thumbs off. <clears throat> dragon boat race. Uh, this is practice for the dragon boat race. In the background, you see part of the new city Zigui. You saw the ancient city Zigui. This is the street, main street in town. It was the same situation with some of these skyscrapers and engineers warning about the instability of the ground. Um, some of these had to be uh, torn down and rebuilt in a more stable area. So we're very close to the construction site now. The manager of this building was very grateful because uh, my friend called her down to uh, explain why the, what the correct spelling is supposed to be uh, for the International Trade Building. Because it, it says, I don't know if you could read it back there, it says, in reactional trade witting. Um, so they were very grateful, and I'm sure that it's absolutely perfect now. But what concerned me was actually, um, this is a fairly simple mistake. And I think people were trying to do it right. Um, how many mistakes were made in the construction of the dam? The, they were trying to make a perfect dam. Um, the landscape was just strewn with, with these kinds of, of objects. Uh, when French and German scientists were called in to, to check this out, uh, they found that the cement had 50% water uh, mixed with it, which was too much. And uh, they were told that um, these, these things, which were supposed to be designed for the coffer dams, which are the temporary dams in the front and the back of the construction site itself, uh, if they were used for that, wouldn't last long enough. So they didn't know what to do with them. And you can also see the farmer trying to make use of every square meter of, of decent farmland. There's fishing. Uh, 
I saw this as being kind of the, the child's dream, in a way. This is on the ferry crossing over to the, to the Three Gorges Dam. The uh, boat captain's sister's hand uh, going through the diversion channel. When the, uh, the Yangtze River was actually blocked in 1997, John Chimin is part of a 14-hour live television broadcast in China, made a speech, and I thought something was kind of interesting that he had said. It's, it reads, um, he said, the age-old dream of the Chinese people to develop and utilize the resources of the three gorges of the Yangtze River has come closer to becoming true. This proves vividly once again, that socialism is superior in being capable of concentrating resources to do big jobs. So it is clearly a political uh, event and process uh, that made for this dam to, to be built. He went on to say, since the twilight of history, the Chinese nation has been engaged in the great feat of conquering, developing, and exploiting nature. The guardian of the wire. <clears throat> Under the longest suspension bridge in China, that's part of the infrastructure for the dam. Uh, also, a lot of people are getting very, very rich uh, from the process of this construction. What was just happening there? Hmm. I'll have to check that out. <clears throat> uh, this is the headquarters building for the management company of the uh, Three Gorges Dam. If anybody's familiar with um, Guernica, the painting by Picasso, there's something about this rock that was chosen. What do you think's happening to that slide? Has that been happening to all of them? I may actually have to do it digitally next time. Um, this is the Chinese workers' housing. Nature trying to reclaim some of what's being taken away. This is part of the, uh, the new ship locks. We're actually inside the construction site. The, uh, the entrance to the construction site was a, a bridge that was guarded by two soldiers with machine guns. And I asked my friend, um, I had a letter of introduction. I said, can we show those soldiers the letter and see what happens? And my friend said, yeah, you know, we can show them the letter, but if they say no, we're done. So um, we didn't show anybody a letter. And, um, and just sort of walked around and, and found some other ways to, to get in where no one said you can't and no one said we could. Um, and it worked out okay. Um, I love traveling in China. I really love uh, the country. Uh, people are unbelievably friendly and, and warm. Uh, I also love their sense of humor. And in this particular case, one of those huge cranes, those gigantic cranes, picked this truck up really far away. And it's coming around, coming around, coming around. And all of a sudden, my friend says, this truck is coming over our heads. And we started to run. And all of a sudden, we heard hundreds of people laughing. Hundreds of people. And it was kind of like, OK, you got us. You know, nice one, nice one. And we just watched the truck going around and around. They put it back exactly where they picked it up. <laughs> and the sense was, it wasn't the first time that they did that. Yeah. 
<clears throat> but it was really great. There's 26 penstocks. Uh, these are the, the pipes that, um, pull, that the gravity pulls the water down into the turbines. So there's 26 of these, and each one of them is designed to carry the volume of water of the Missouri River. Think about that for a minute. The construction site itself, a uh, very surreal thing to see. Uh, there was a, a sense, uh, it was kind of like, um, you know, pharaohs meet Star Wars or something like that. Just an unbelievable vision. This is what it looked like in 2004. It's a friend of mine, Chinese photographer, made the picture. Then the last slide is a, uh, actually a satellite photograph. I'd like to close with a, a poem written by Mao Zedong. He went for a swim in the Yangtze River in 1956. And following that swim, he wrote this poem. Great plans are afoot. A stone wall will span the north and south, turning a deep chasm into a thoroughfare to hold back Wusan's clouds and rain till a smooth lake rises in the narrow gorges. The mountain goddess if she is still there, will marvel at a world so changed. So that is my reality story. Thanks.